On October 21st in 1978, a young pilot named Frederick Valentich took off from Melbourne, Australia for what should have been a routine flight. Little did he know, he was about to become the center of one of aviation's most baffling mysteries, one that would involve a military cover-up, UFOs, psychics, and a desperate search for the truth. You won't want to miss this one. On June 9, 1958, Frederick Valentich was born in Avondale Heights, a suburb of Melbourne, Australia. While he was born into a loving family, Fred was just your average kid growing up in the suburbs. But there was one thing that set him apart, his burning desire to soar through the skies. From a young age, all Fred could think about was becoming a pilot. It was his dream, his passion, his everything. But despite his dreams of becoming an aviator, Fred experienced several setbacks. He eventually obtained a class four instrument rating at the age of 20, allowing him to fly at night, but experienced a lot of difficulty in trying to further his career. Twice, Fred had applied to join the Royal Australian Air Force and twice he'd been denied, but not on the basis of his competency. They rejected him on lacking adequate educational qualifications. But despite these setbacks, Fred persevered. He spent as much time as he could working towards his goal of becoming a full-time airman. But he also failed these tests as well. It seems like Fred had a reputation for being reckless, relying on his instinct rather than his training. One time, a plane that he was flying strayed into controlled airspace above Sydney. Another time, twice actually, he deliberately flew into a cloud despite being warned not to. The end result was that he was denied a commercial license on five separate occasions, all because of this record. Well folks, things are about to get dark, and let me tell you, there is a heck of a plot twist coming. On Saturday, October 21st, 1978, Fred took off in a Cessna 182L light aircraft at exactly 6.19 in the evening from Murabin Airport. His destination was a spot north of Tasmania known as King Island, a journey which would take him over the Bass Strait. Basically, Fred had two reasons for the trip. The first was that he was hoping to log more night flying time. As of his departure, Fred was only allowed to fly at night in visual meteorological conditions or when the weather was clear. And if he ever hoped to advance his career, he'd need more experience flying when it was dark. The other reason that Fred was traveling to King Island shows the kind of person he was. At the time, Fred served as an instructor with the Air Training Corps and wanted to give his fellow aviators a treat. His plan was to pick up some crayfish from King Island for everyone to enjoy. And some later reports claim that Fred also mentioned seeing some friends while on this short trip. And so Fred set off into the night, everything going smoothly for the time being. And around 40 minutes into his flight, he passes over the lighthouse at Cape Otway. But then something strange happened. At 7.06 p.m., Fred radios the flight service unit and says, pilot to ground, is there any known traffic in my area below 5,000 feet? And the FSU responded, negative, no known traffic. Three minutes goes by without any further contact. Ground crew at the flight service unit called in to try and clarify what he said, asking him to describe the aircraft. And now he had told ground control that the craft was nowhere to be seen. And the technicians on the ground repeated his statement. They radioed, confirm it has vanished. And Fred answered, affirmative, do you know what sort of aircraft I've got? Is it military? 
and the flight service unit denied the presence of any military aircraft in the area. But just when it seemed like the worst was over, Fred issued another message. At 7.12 p.m., six minutes after initially spotting the strange object in the sky over the Bass Strait, Fred said, the engine is rough and idling. I've got it set. The ground crew responded with Fred's call sign. Delta Sierra Juliet Roger, what are your intentions? Fred responded like the young professional he was. But something interrupted his explanation. The last words that Frederick Valentich ever spoke was his call sign, Delta Sierra. And then this, seven of the weirdest seconds of UFO audio ever recorded. Listen to it again. What do you hear? It sounds like a crash or some sort of bizarre clattering sound. The radio went silent. Ground control eagerly awaited his arrival at King Island, hoping that just his communications had gone haywire. But his scheduled arrival time of 7.28 p.m. came and went with no signs of Valentich. Disturbingly, while the replies from the flight service unit on the ground were recorded in official transcripts, they were erased in the recordings of Fred's flight. Now this seems really unusual, doesn't it? It might not mean anything, but if there was a conspiracy to cover up Fred's fate, is it possible that the transcription of the conversation could have been fraudulent? Immediately after, a search was mounted. Eight civilian aircraft were enlisted in the search. The military even got involved. Right away, the Royal Australian Air Force dispatched the Orion, a long-range maritime reconnaissance aircraft from South Australia. It followed the exact same flight path that Fred had flied, but found nothing. The only thing even remotely suggesting that a crash had occurred was an oil slick that appeared on Sunday near King Island, which was 18 miles to the north. But there was no debris. Everyone was excited when some material was recovered, but this turned out just to be plastic bags and packing cases. And out of the 1,000 square miles that was searched from the air, it yielded no results. The search was called off four days later. Clearly, something happened to Frederick Valentich in October of 1978. But what exactly? It wasn't until July of 1983 that there was an actual break in the Valentich case. While not conclusive, the Bureau of Air Safety Investigation revealed that a piece of debris was found by the Royal Australian Navy Research Laboratory. The material was part of a cowl flap found on the shore of Flinders Island on the eastern border of the Bass Strait. Not only did it belong to a Cessna 182, but the serial numbers fell within a range that would have included Fred's airplane. As it turns out, the official documentation was vague about Fred's fate. In May of 1982, the Bureau of Air Safety Investigation acting on behalf of the Australian Department of Aviation, released a file on their investigation into the events of October 21st, 1978. Their findings? Location of occurrence not known. Time not known. Degree of injury presumed fatal. Opinion as to cause. The reason for the disappearance of the aircraft has not been determined. In short, the investigation determined diddly squat. But here's where things get weird. Basically, the main researcher leading the investigation into the Valentich disappearance was longtime ufologist Bill Chalker, and this report didn't sit well with him. So Bill followed up with the Secretary of Air Safety Investigation at the Department of Aviation, a man by the name of G. V. Hughes, and Hughes told Bill this. The Royal Australian Air Force is responsible for the investigation of reports concerning UFO sightings, and liaison was established with the RAAF on these aspects of the investigation. Now, the decision as to whether or not the UFO report is being investigated rests with the RAAF and not with this department. Okay, clear enough, right? 
The Royal Australian Air Force is the group in charge, so Bill, being a good and thorough investigator, reaches out to the RAAF, and this is what he said he found out. During 1982, over four separate visits, totaling six days, I was able to examine what was ostensibly the entirety of the official UFO files held by the Directorate of Air Force Intelligence. There was no extant documentation on the Valentich incident in the RAAF files I examined. It was explained to me that the RAAF did not investigate the affair because they were not asked to by the Department of Aviation. Meaning that, in other words, the Valentich disappearance had become something of a hot potato. Nobody wanted to touch it. The Department of Aviation said, go ask the RAAF, while the RAAF said, go ask the Department of Aviation. So what about the crazy sound at the end of his transmission? Maybe it was the sound of the craft interfering with Fred's radio, or maybe the microphone even picked up a collision. Well, extensive analysis has been conducted on this six to seven second noise that happens at the end of the audio recording. Most of it was carried out by Dr. Richard Haynes, a scientist with a deep interest in the UFO phenomenon. In the early 1980s, he concluded this. In the metallic noises, containing 36 separate bursts with fairly constant start and stop pulses, bounding each one, there are no discernible patterns in time or frequency to these bursts. Dr. Haynes concluded that the effect was similar to that produced by rapid keying of the microphone, but he points out that control tests using the same technique were noticeably different from the original sound. The identity of the sound remains a mystery, but whatever it captured, it seemed to cause Frederick Valentich's airplane to crash into the vast strait, or is what we heard literally the sound of the UFO colliding with his Cessna, which has been an idea that's been supported in an issue of the Journal for Scientific Exploration from the year 2000. Either way, it seems that one of the two things is happening, either simple government incompetence or a government cover-up. I mean, there would be plenty of reasons to keep Fred's disappearance a secret. He did allude to somehow reading secret files, and if he really did encounter a UFO that night, then it would be in the Australian government's best interest to keep the exact details of the incident under wraps. But there's more twists and turns to this story, which brings us to an interesting part. Was Frederick Valentich the victim of UFO interference? Well, his father certainly seemed to think so, at least at one point or another. He went on the record several times, confessing that he suspected his own son had been borrowed by visitors from another planet. In other words, he was abducted. But it's important to remember that his father was being swamped with calls from ufologists in the first few years after Fred vanished, and all of them were eager to make this into a UFO case. However, maybe there is some truth to this. What's equally interesting is after talking to Fred's father, he confirmed to Bill that his son was a believer in UFOs and because of a previous sighting his son had, Fred, is where the interest started. In fact, about eight to 10 months before Fred's disappearance, he claimed that he saw a brightly lit object off in the western sky that flew at tremendous speeds from south to north. However, what's really interesting is that his son had apparently been allowed to read some sort of secret UFO file, as vague and ambiguous as that is. What's really strange to me is that Fred encountering a UFO in this region isn't exactly isolated. And as it turns out, this period in the fall of 1978 was filled with UFO sightings. To the north, several hundred military personnel saw an enormous unidentified flying object just days before Fred's disappearance. The object was said to have covered half the sky and was close to the ground as it shined a pair of searchlights and then left without a trace. What's even more bizarre is that the immediate vicinity where Fred disappeared became a hot spot around the time that he vanished. Remember how Fred reported the UFO just after passing Cape Otway? Well, a civilian UFO organization claimed to have obtained photographs taken by a plumber, Roy Manifold, and it shows an object exiting the water at a rapid speed. The location, right by the Cape Otway Lighthouse. 
The most widely circulated picture supposedly shows an object leaving the Bass Strait and a blast of cloudy smoke. Here's another plot twist for you. The day was October 21st, 1978, the same day that Frederick Valentich vanished without a trace, and even more crazy is the fact that by some estimates, there were up to 15 sightings on that day, all of which remain unexplained. There were also extensive sightings in the months leading up to his disappearance. In his write-up on the Valentich disappearance and Ronald D's stories, Mammoth Encyclopedia of Extraterrestrial Encounters, Bill Chalker wrote this. During a two-month period centered around January 1978, vacationers, fishermen, school teachers, local police, and lighthouse keepers in the Cape Otway area saw UFOs. Even earlier, during July 1977, local residents and the lighthouse keeper at Cape Otway saw an inexplicable brilliant light source that hovered out to sea for half an hour. Bill went on to describe even more recent UFO sightings in and around the Bass Strait in more recent years. Now, additionally, in a research paper, Richard F. Haynes and Paul Norman both found three new eyewitnesses to the Valentich disappearance. On the evening of October 21st, 1978, all three of them described being in the vicinity of Cape Otway and seeing the exact same thing. An airplane descending downward at a steep angle with a much larger object with green lights flying just above it. So here we have this pilot and we have this strange transmission coupled with the fact that this potentially could be a government or military cover-up because it deals with UFOs and there seems to be a plethora of various eyewitness sightings of strange, unidentified craft in and around the area. But what does all of this mean? It's agreed upon by the majority of people that he simply did not run out of fuel. In fact, all aviation experts agreed that the Cessna had a full tank of fuel, which meant he could have flown another 500 miles without having to stop. So did that mean he simply broke communication? After all, it's been claimed that Fred's airplane never did show up on the radar, even when he was in communication with ground control. What would cause that? Because this is flat out weird. In conjunction with that, there are even strange reports of a small aircraft landing near Cape Otway that same night. So it gives. Is it possible he was running away from his life and starting anew? While it's always plausible, it doesn't seem probable. In fact, interviews with Fred's friends and doctors all explain that he was very content and happy with his life. And so it just wouldn't make sense for him to up and abandon everything. So then how else do we explain all of these bizarre circumstances? Well, maybe he was just a terrible pilot. And as a matter of fact, just look at the number of times he failed the various aviation tests. Not to mention his track record was a bit on the reckless side. Is it possible he was simply a victim of his own errors? Well, for a lot of people, the most widely accepted possibility is that Fred was simply disoriented. They say that he was upside down, mistaking a reflection for the craft above him, maybe even the lights from his own airplane. What do you guys think about that? Maybe in a state of disorientation, false visual references led Fred to misidentifying the horizon and would have accidentally force his plane into a death spiral that would ultimately cause engine failure and would send him crashing beneath the waves. But if that was the case, then how do you explain the strange aircraft hovering above Fred's plane? Well, it was suggested that it was just a star like Venus or Mercury. However, given his background as a pilot, do you really think that it, he would have made that misidentification? Interestingly, right before he died, Fred was talking to somebody over the radio a ground control technician by the name of Steve Roby. Now, it wasn't until December 9th of 1980 that Steve would speak with the Melbourne Herald about his conversation with Fred because at the time, the disorientation theory was very popular and all he had to say about it was this. Towards the end, I think he was definitely concerned for his safety. I considered that he would have had to have been a good actor to have put it all together the way he did. It was though he was looking around for this thing as he was speaking on the radio. It was kind of a rushed communication. It was as if he was startled. You can tell he was concerned. He put up his call sign before Melbourne. He was a little mixed up. So 
if that was the case, then what's going on? Well, there's still more to the story I haven't told you. In the immediate aftermath of Fred's disappearance, a number of people stepped up claiming that they had the answers, many of whom were psychics. One claimed to have contacted Fred in place of a bright light where he was no longer physical, meaning he didn't have a body, meaning he was dead. Interestingly, this psychic also claimed that Fred's spirit said that the Austrian government had deliberately withheld a full minute of the audio recording from the public. He then revised his claims a month later, asserting that Fred had been taken deep within the hollow earth. However, in August of 1979, a bizarre prediction by Burley Smith made the news with Sydney's Daily Mirror. He's alive, missing pilot. Frederick Valentich will return before Christmas in a different form. When Frederick returns, it will be to a Shelley beach on an island. He will give the world an intricate description of what he saw. That's a pretty bold claim. Unfortunately for her, her prediction was wrong. But here's the plot twist that's going to blow your mind. The January 2002 issue of the Mutual UFO Network Journal features an editor's note that mentions how a shocking discovery was made by a Spanish researcher of the name of Manuel Carballal and that there have been multiple eyewitness testimonies who have all claimed to have seen a strange man residing on the island of Tenerife in the Canary Islands, specifically at the Plaza del Charco, which is a seaport square. Can you guess the identity of this man? None other than Frederick Valentich, the Australian pilot who vanished mysteriously in 1978, was seen alive and well in 1990. Apparently, this man identified himself as so and even had an Australian passport to prove his claim. But what's really bizarre is that he told all the people he spoke with on multiple occasions that he now belonged to a group of humans who had been recruited by extraterrestrials. What's also bizarre is that he had no signs of aging and perfectly resembled the photos that had circulated around the time of his disappearance, which means he still looked about 20, 21 years old. Wait a minute. I thought you said that the 1979 prediction was wrong. Well, it was, but only partially. Her prediction of him returning was accurate. She just got the date wrong. But what about the holes in the story that we haven't addressed? There are many people that have pointed out that Fred probably wouldn't have had his passport with him the night he vanished, which is true. Not to mention that if a passport is issued in 1978, it more than likely would have expired by 1990. So there is a lot of bizarre circumstances surrounding this. Was Frederick Valentich a bad pilot, as the official narrative goes, or did he simply know too much? Was there something he learned that the authorities wanted to cover up that had them doing everything they could to keep him from having an active career in aviation? Or was he truly taken like he claimed and brought back to a different time period? Now, let me ask you one last question. If it really was him, is he just content living out the rest of his life on this island and not making contact with his family and the rest of the world? And because you guys made it this far into the episode, I want you to all comment down below, he knew too much. So that way, I know who made it to the end of the video and who didn't. And if you guys enjoy stories like these, where we deep dive into strange cases and eyewitness testimonies of the strange, supernatural, and mysterious, then what are you waiting for? Go ahead and slap that like and subscribe button for more content just like this. And as always, never forget, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll see you all in the very next episode.